Welcome back to breakfast. Underpaid, understaffed, undervalued. Firefighters across Aotearoa are battling against what they're calling a crisis within the fire within fire and emergency New Zealand, also known as FENS. The New Zealand Professional Firefighters Union have re-entered strike action following unsuccessful negotiations with FENS. Hour-long strikes are planned for the 19th and 26th of this month. The question is, will it bring about any change? This morning we're speaking with the crew at the Auckland Central Fire Station, firefighters Terry Bird and Josh Nichols, and also Ringo Harwood there. Uh, Morena, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, Josh, I just wanted to start off with you. Tell me about what your main concerns are, particularly in dealing with fens. Morena, um, that's a raft of concerns actually. It's a, it's a whole lot of different fundamental pillars that we seem to be failing on. Uh, from fleet to equipment to staff, uh, often to training around the psychological impacts that we're encountering out there in operations with our medical co-response calls. And what, what about with pay as well? Yeah, pay does make up a, a, a part of it, but like I say, there's a whole lot of fundamental failings as an organisation that encompass this whole problem that we're talking about and bringing to the forefront. Sure, OK. And we'll come back to pay. I just want to um, touch on some of the key issues here. So you mentioned some of them. The staffing is one as well. Unsafe staffing levels, uh, staff being forced to work over time, staff stations and uh, f forced to work over time, um, and also just to staff the stations and financially to make ends meet. Josh, I might come to you with this. Uh, what, tell us what that looks like on the ground. When you've got staff shortages, how does that play out in a fire and emergency scenario? when you're called. Yeah, so obviously uh, the standard fire truck has four people in it. When we can't man that truck, that puts the safety of those guys at risk when we go out and respond. That draws on other appliances to come in and back them up above and beyond what we would normally need to respond to that incident. It also puts a lot of undue stress on our staff. These guys that come to work every day uh, come to work with a passion and a drive to go out and support New Zealanders. And... When we can't man our trucks, we feel like we're letting down the, the New Zealand public. And yet you need to take care of yourselves too, don't you, Terry? Yeah, that's right. I think um, like working lots of hours is is um, hard on on us. And I think, um, you know, we talked about mental well-being and the more hours you work, the more likely you are to suffer from that, that kind of thing. Fatigue, can't get enough sleep um, and, you know, more likely to have an accident. Terry, one of the issues that Josh spoke, spoke about, and that is part of the concerns that you're raising, are trucks and equipment breaking down. How long have those issues been going on for? Yeah, it, it, would, it appears to me that uh, fire and emergency hasn't planned far enough ahead. Um, you, sh you know, you should be... Uh, you, sh you are aware that your fleet is aging, you need to be planning in advance and you need to be procuring new, new ones. And for fire and emergency, they have been slow to do that. They've had a few problems along the way, but the reality right now is that we're driving around in, in fire appliances that are beyond the, the life that we expect of them and they are not really up to the workload that they're getting. We would normally retire these to, to quiet places and we are using them in, in busy fire stations and they are breaking down regularly and um, that, that shouldn't be a surprise to us. They're not, they're not modern trucks. Terry, do you have perhaps a rough estimate or figure to give us a picture of how widespread this problem is as to how many stations or districts are in that situation that you're describing right now with fire trucks and equipment breaking down? Yeah, so we're a national fire brigade and uh, so this affects everyone across the country. At the moment, uh, Wellington has no aerial capacity, no uh, heavy aerial capacity, they're broken. Um, we know that there are, there are about 100 urban fire appliances which are over 20 years old, some of them as old as 28 years old, while we are waiting for a new injection of appliances. So this is a widespread problem. 
Wow, and, and this is about keeping the public and yourselves safe, obviously. <laughs> uh, Ringo, uh, other issues that are on the table here are pay negotiations as well. We did reach out to FENS and they have responded to us. I've said they are extremely disappointed at the NZPFU's decision to escalate to industrial action despite a substantially increased offer, which would have seen a pay increase of between 8% and 19% for all firefighters. What's your response to that? Well, my response to that is that um, they're playing with figures, so they always have done. And one of the biggest concerns that I have, and I've been in the job over 50 years now, that some of these people down there making these decisions are firefighters that joined after me. And they know very well, and they've been through this threat and strike action stuff before, and they know very well what we're up against. And they can play with figures and say 18 to 90% or whatever, but in reality, that's not the only thing we're after. It's after, like Terry said, the maintenance of the trucks, our fleet, our management, our well-being, all these things come to play. So it's not just about wages, and I want to make that, that quite clear. But um, I must emphasise that we've been through these things before, since I joined, and time and time again, uh, we've got to front up and do it. We also get sick and tired of people saying, how can you cross the road and let a house burn with people in it or whatever? Well, it's come to the stage now that with the uh, closing of the stations, that's going to happen. We had a big, big uh, PC public uh, thing going a few years back about um, how quickly fire develops, and it does develop. We're not talking about minutes, we're talking about seconds. And with those stations being closed, we can't get there in that required time. So we people, I don't want to cross the road. I don't definitely don't want to cross the road, but I'm going to have to this time because this is what it's come down to. What I'm getting from, from you, Ringo, is that obviously lives are at risk here with everything you guys are negotiating and asking for, the concerns that you're raising. <laughs> Ringo, 50 years in the fire service, have you ever seen the situation as bad as what you're seeing today? No, never. The, and this, I couldn't believe it when it started happening. We were starting to close stations down. I thought, man, where are we going? What's happened with our, with our management, our um, resources? And they've known for quite a few years now that we are getting short in Auckland and can't attract people. And it all comes down to attracting people um, with a good uh, uh, money-wise money uh, so they can survive. And a lot of people who want to join the job, they've got to drop twenty to $30,000 to become a recruit. Now, that's not going to work, I'm afraid. Terry Bird, yep. Josh Nichols, my, and Ringo Harwood, uh, our firefighters here at the Auckland Central Fire Station. I mean, I know <clears throat> words don't pay much at all or, or return anything that you're asking for, but we do appreciate your service. We do appreciate the risks that you guys take for us in the public. And we thank you for being with us this morning and uh, wish you the best of luck for the negotiations. Thank you. Firefighters across New Zealand will strike this Friday, battling what they're calling a fire crisis. The hour-long strikes follow unsuccessful negotiations with Fire and Emergency New Zealand earlier this year, saying they're underpaid, understaffed and undervalued. Firefighter Josh Nichols believes staff are under immense stress due to work-related pressures. When we can't man that truck, that puts the safety of those guys at risk when we go out and respond. That draws on other appliances to come in and back them up above and beyond what we would normally need to respond to that incident. It also puts a lot of undue stress on our staff. These guys that come to work every day uh, come to work with a passion and a drive to go out and support New Zealanders. And when we can't man our trucks, we feel like we're letting down the, the New Zealand public. The strike will take place between 11am and 12pm this Friday, with a second strike the following Friday. across the country say they're underpaid, understaffed and undervalued and battling what they're calling a fire crisis. They're set to strike this Friday following unsuccessful negotiations with Fire and Emergency New Zealand earlier this year. Ringo Hardwood says in the 50 years he's worked as a firefighter, he's never seen the situation so bad. 
I must emphasise that we've been through these things before since I joined, and time and time again, uh, we've got to front up and do it. We also get sick and tired of people saying, how can you cross the road and let a house burn with people in it or whatever? Well, it's come to the stage now that with the uh, closing of the stations, that's going to happen. The strike will take place between 11am and 12pm this Friday with a second strike set for the following Friday. Welcome back to breakfast. This morning we've been speaking with the firefighters at the Central Auckland Fire Station on what they're calling a fire crisis within Fire and Emergency New Zealand, known as FENS. The station crew are joining us now. Good morning to you all. Good morning, Maria. Look, thanks again for joining us. I know it's a pretty big time going back into negotiations after the last negotiations uh, you were unsuccessful in. Um, I'm, I'm seeing that every one of you is mic'd up. Can I go back to Terry? Uh, Terry, are you there? Uh, Terry, what I've yes, also read... What I've also read here, Terry, is that uh, fire and emergency services had been signed up under the 2014 MOU, Memorandum of Understanding. You're required to go to all life-threatening calls alongside St. John as part of that agreement. Can you tell me whether or not your staff received extra training or extra support to be able to respond to those situations? Yeah, so we respond um, to assist ambulance at cardiac arrest events. And um, to answer your question, no, we, we've received um, no additional training. We do basically a slightly customised uh, basic first aid course to allow us to do that. Um, we do get quite good at CPR. We get to do quite a lot of it. I've been to more events than I can remember, uh, but I haven't had a lot of it success. Uh, I've also seen a lot of emotion, they're very, very emotional um, situations because families are experiencing loss and uh, it's not a very pleasant environment to be in um, uh, over and over again. Terry, can you just clarify that again? Uh, you only have your basic first aid training, yet you're required to go as a first responder to these incidents, these call outs uh, alongside St. John's. <clears throat> That's correct. We have a couple of extra things that we can do. Um, we have uh, a defibrillator training. I don't think that's in the first uh, basic first aid course, but other than that, that's about what we've got. Do you, you, you talked about the emotional toll that it takes on you because obviously quite a number of these incidents you, uh, you know, don't end very well or as well as we would hope, one would hope. We, but we've reached out to FEMS and they have said the health and safety and well-being of our firefighters is paramount to us. They acknowledge <laughs> the concerns the union has raised. Um, I can tell how you guys feel about that statement. They said they acknowledge the concerns that the union has raised and continue to work constructively with you to address your concerns. Ringo, do you feel like they're actually listening? Uh, definitely not. The, the problem is that um, the recruits that are coming off the recruit courses after 13 weeks are given very basic uh, training, first aid training. And some of the uh, young people, young firefighters are coming through now, have been to more cardiac arrests than they have been to fires. And they didn't join the job for that. They joined to be a firefighter. And sure, it's, it's about saving lives and being uh, part of that system. But uh, with St John's the way it is, and so run down, and, the, and sometimes we were waiting 20 minutes, half an hour for the ambulance to turn up. And we're put in places where, um, in a family home, where a young person's um, gone down with some sort of sickness or illness, and we're working on them praying that the ambulance is going to turn up so they can take over from us and we've got the family to deal with and it's it's very stressing on on those people some people handle it some people don't but for young firefighters to come through that system and be put into that place at that time and and for the for our firm to say they're looking after their well-being no they're not fire and emergency doesn't prepare us for that no um you know they they should perhaps be screening people before they become firefighters to make sure that they're going to be able to deal with some of that that trauma um, i have an experience with uh, a recruit that worked with me who after a period of time stopped coming to work 
and that's because he'd been exposed to too many traumatic events and had post-traumatic stress disorder and that's that was you know that's really tough for him and um, you know it's it's disappointing for us that uh, you know better support isn't provided early I think a good point to note too just while we're there and we're talking about it is that we've had some guys we've got a, a, a guy a good senior firefighter Josh Darby who's, who's become a, a, a researcher into uh, post-traumatic stress he's done some amazing work he's, he's put out a report in 2018 uh, highlighting some of the areas that we're deficient in and yet nothing has changed in any of our progression training as Ringo said any of our recruit training to give you a statistic on, on just the Auckland Central District alone since 2013 we've had a 4,000% increase on our uh, experience with fatality rates uh, wow. and purple coated calls so that's all your critically ill patients a 4,000% increase in fat fatalities and exposure Okay, so since four thousand percent and four th since two. So the last decade, four thousand percent increase. This is on top of understaffing, uh, pay parity issues that you're trying to negotiate, mm -hmm. and uh, poor or broken equipment, uh, fire trucks that you're having to deal with, and stations needing to close down. Uh, Terry, what you do, we all know, is an honourable and admirable job uh, protecting the lives of the public, saving lives as well. Josh, can you tell me what inspired you to become a firefighter and why is this job important to you? Well, I think it's two things. It's, it's um, well, for me personally, I've grown up around this job, grown up around Ringo and Terry. My, my, I'm a third generation firefighter. I've, I've spent all my life at this station from, from day dot. It's two things. It's, it's the people you work with. This is a family. Uh, and it's the people we get to help. Um, it's a privilege to be able to jump on that truck and go out and help the people in the community in their times of need, yeah? One thing I want to I stress for us is, you know, <clears throat> for the firefighters, we've tried to maintain our integrity. Uh, we've tried to maintain our professionalism. We've tried to be non-emotive. Our organisation has some systemic failures at the moment. We've had hundreds of million dollars put into unifying our organisation and yet nothing has changed for us on frontline operations and the way that we go about and do our business every day. That's for our, our readiness, our response, our reduction, our recovery, nothing has changed. Would you encourage recruits today, if you had a chance to, knowing what you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's still the best job in the world. It's still the best job in the world. Uh, and we will still get on the truck and we'll do the best we can every time we go out there. Uh, one thing I want to stress, you know, we, we have these values as an organisation and they're very strong values. Uh, there's four of them and they go, we're better together, we do the right thing, we strive to improve and we serve and support. And right now, those, those values, those tenets that we have as an organisation, we're not delivering on those. And I think we really need to get real about having a good, long, hard look at ourselves from the top and turn this conversation into some action. Because at the end of the day, all we are doing is we're failing the New Zealand public. I think the organisation needs to um, start speaking in plain language and stop using uh, highly paid media people um, to tell them what to do, right? Where they're talking in riddles and we really want to know the truth about what's going on. Josh, Terry, Ringo and the rest of your staff there at the Auckland uh, Central Fire Station. It's just down the road from us. Uh, we appreciate you guys um, and wish you all the best for your negotiations. Thank you for raising your concerns here on the Breakfast Platform as well. Yeah, we'd like to say thanks to the New Zealand public too. There's been some overwhelming yeah. support for uh, backing us for what we're going through. Yeah, cheers. Thank you. Thank Kia ora. Kia ora.